thank you everyone for joining us on you know relatively short notice but one of the reasons for you know getting everyone together is that we, we were like somewhere between shocked and concerned over how many people in alberta seem to think that restoring the alberta advantage is going to be as simple as just electing a new conservative government and as most of us know like our, our like there's a lot of there's a lot of hurdles to restoring the alberta advantage but one of the main hurdles is the fact that we know we've been left with a high cost government the canadian average for providing services to taxpayers is more or less ten thousand dollars and we're spending about twelve thousand five hundred which multiplied by our four million people is about a ten billion dollar a year cost that we're having and if you look at businesses that are trying to decide whether they should stay in alberta or businesses or leave or businesses that are thinking of coming to alberta like they know that that extra ten billion dollars in cost is eventually going to be passed on to them in taxes so if they're looking at a five or ten or twenty year project they certainly aren't going to be looking to move to a jurisdiction that has costs that are you know ten billion dollars higher or 25 percent higher than in neighboring jurisdictions so what we were hoping to do today here was not necessarily come to any you know just, just sort of you know put a range of issues on the table like tools that might be used to restore the alberta advantage as you know you know like some of our political people are you know laying out you know you know, like some things, but they're sort of they're sort of playing around the margins. They're not actually prepared to talk about the uh, you know the really the serious decisions that we have to make. And so we want to talk about this just so that you know as the discussion on <coughs> over the next five or six months, we can actually sort of you know feed it into the you know the, the conservative leadership race into the policy development process and say these are these are the challenges to restoring the advantage. These are some of the tools that we could that we could use to do this and. Some of them are quite politically uh, unacceptable at the moment, but it's uh, uh, one of the speakers at our you know, winter conference said, Ernest Hemingway went broke and they asked him, how, like, how did you go broke? And he said, two ways, slowly then suddenly. And quite frankly, I'm not sure if we're on the slowly part or if we're right near suddenly, but on Friday at, uh, on Danielle Smith, they had someone from the Fraser Institute talking and they just did a study and he said, they were actually alarmed at how quickly Alberta's financial situation is is literally you know becoming a basket case so that's what we're trying to do today let's just we'll have a good discussion as we go along John's going to start off on some you know if you want to call it I guess his perspective of how we should look at it because we've had lots of well-meaning politicians over the years but basically we've gone backward every year in our lifetime and this is the one thing that one of the things that we struggle with is we're all doing our best but we're just slowly going backwards and so John's going to start Marcel's going to speak after that uh, thank you all for coming on you know very short notice and uh, but I guess we're just looking forward to having a really interesting day. So, John, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Danny. Thank you, everybody, for coming out here. Uh, I'm sure this is going to be a productive and lively discussion. We're here to talk about restoring the Alberta advantage, which means essentially getting policy right so that you have a healthy government balance sheet on top of a healthy economy. And in one sense, this isn't about Alberta at all. We're here to talk about the tools that are available to any government, anywhere in the world, to ensure fairness, growth, and government solvency. And different people are going to talk about different tools that are available, uh, not necessarily conflicting, often complementary tools. And we may have some disagreements about which are the most urgent, uh, which are going to be the most effective, which are the most important over time. But by the end of the day, what I hope we're going to do is put on the table essentially all those tools that are plausibly available to regimes across Canada and around the world to ensure good governance, meaning, again, a strong economy and responsible government that does not spend beyond its means in ways that eventually provoke a crisis and severe problems both economically and in terms of governance. And I think it's important for politicians and citizens to explain what can be done partly so they understand what can't be done to recognize that we do have a pretty good idea of what measures are available to governments that can be used to good effect so that people will not d deceive themselves that perhaps if we wait until after the election we'll think of something really clever that nobody's ever come up with before if you're a voter maybe the person I support and I like the way they talk and they make me feel comfortable about the future they'll think of something they haven't thought of it yet or they'd have told me in their platform what is available is fairly well understood and it, the problem here for policymakers and citizens is to decide which of these are we going to use, 
how are we going to make them work? How are we going to make them work administratively? How are we going to make them work politically? Because that can be, uh, that can be a significant problem. And as I say, in one sense, that has nothing at all to do with Alberta. But in another sense, it has everything to do with Alberta. Because the Alberta advantage is shorthand for what was long thought to be a kind of cultural disposition to sound government. Not that regimes in Alberta didn't make mistakes, but there was a kind of a feeling that the politicians and the people of this province understood that government must not become too big or too meddlesome, or it would kill the goose that laid the golden eggs, that it would be bad for people in their private lives, which of course is what it's really all about, but it would also be bad for government. And therefore, there was thought to be a kind of a limit to how wrong policy could go in Alberta. And businesses would therefore invest in Alberta in confidence that even if there was, were one or two things that didn't seem to be right, it was not going to proceed in that direction to an unreasonable degree. And if businesses have long time horizons, and contrary to what's often said, they do have longer time horizons than governments, it's really important that they have confidence that Alberta or Ontario or wherever you happen to live is a good place to invest for the long run. And certainly, whatever this Alberta advantage used to be, you know, it ain't working like it once did. Um, you remember there used to be those bumper stickers that said, you know, please, Lord, send us another oil boom and we promise we won't. I think it said squander it next time or words to that effect. But in fact, it's pretty clear that Alberta did squander another oil boom. And now that the price of oil has fallen, the consequences of this action are becoming painfully clear. Uh, but it didn't happen all that recently. Uh, especially people with a strong partisan commitment are tempted to say, oh, it's that awful NDP. Look what they're doing. And they certainly don't seem to be seized of the difficulties. But if you look at the budgetary t direction Alberta was on under the progressive conservatives, not just after Ralph Klein, but before Ralph Klein, and funnily enough, for the second half, for Ralph 2.0, this trouble has been brewing for a very long time. Perhaps thinking you had this built-in advantage made Albertans a little careless about making sure that they kept it. Uh, for instance, I, I came across, I have this pernicious habit of writing down things in the newspaper in enormous quantities so that afterward I can go back and check when I suddenly need them and I don't remember them as I think they should have been but as they actually were. And so there was a uh, story in the newspaper said, the Alberta budget will increase spending by 11.5% over three years. That's from the Globe and Mail, in 1999, with Ralph Klein in office. That wasn't meant to be happening, was it? Uh, in 1994, BC Report was saying, Alberta has a spending problem, not a revenue problem. And again, Ralph Klein came in, and apparently he agreed with that. And he made all kinds of cuts. He made the kind of cuts they say you can't make. He cut social programs. He cut spending on health and education. He cut spending on welfare which is the one social program it's normally safe to target uh, because the recipients tend not to be politically organized or effective advocates. And uh, naturally, this was reported. I think it was McLean's that, that hating Ralph Klein is bound to spread as the enormity of Alberta's deficit cutting exercise begins to sink in. Enormity means great wickedness, right? So that was how it was reported. But the funny thing is, people didn't start hating Ralph Klein, at least not in this province. He became a popular hate figure elsewhere, but here people loved him. You could cut and be popular, at least in Alberta. Again, suggesting that there was an Alberta advantage in the culture here. But, and this is a big but, a lot of that was illusion. Uh, in 1994, Ralph Klein uh, gave an interview in which he said, our revenues are $11.4 billion a year. And we believe this is enough money with which to run a province of two and a half million people. Yet, by 2003, 2004, he was burning through over $20 billion a year and running a surplus. A year later, $22.7 billion for just over 3.2 million people, $7,000 per capita, second highest in the country. And it just kept going on. The next year, spending hit $24.4 billion, then $25.5. And the Globe and Mail ran a headline saying, um, Alberta budget, stingy or prudent? <coughs> kind of a curious thing to say about that kind of trajectory. And uh, I was planning to flatter Jack Mintz. He's not yet in the room, but I'm going to quote him anyway. Because he was out here. 
in 2006. And he gave a talk to the Calgary Chamber of Commerce where he said, do not take the Alberta advantage for granted. Your tax system is not as good as it needs to be. If you don't look out, you're going to be back in deficit by 2010. So Jack predicted that before the 2008 recession. And of course, they did nothing. If you look at a graph of spending and revenue and deficits in Alberta covering the Klein years, you see that there is a big drop in spending. But revenue keeps shooting up. The deficit goes away. The debt gets paid down. But spending continues to skyrocket. And revenue chases it and chases it and chases it. And it keeps up for a long time. But it couldn't keep up indefinitely. Because revenue is not going to grow 8% a year. It's just not. And it's a big mystery to me why, if people are getting better off, they need more, not less government. This is something that apparently gets taken for granted a great deal. Ralph Klein eventually got tired of politics and stepped down. Ed Stelmach came in, and he said, I can assure you we're going to be very prudent in our budgeting. I'm asking ministers to look at their programs. Are there some frills in the budget or something that we've put in the budget that won't necessarily support families and seniors? And what happened, of course, Alberta went back into deficit and kept right on spending. All there was was a temporary program of restraint to deal with the wolf at the door. And as soon as the wolf was down by the end of the driveway, looking kind of peaceful, they went back to spending. And again, it, it's a funny thing about Alberta that in things like charter schools, you think if this is the right-wing limited government province, they would be very favorable toward alternatives to the public school system. But in fact, they're very restrictive. Ralph Klein put a freeze on auto insurance. There are all kinds of measures in the Klein years that have nothing to do with small government in any sense. Now, it is true that in cutting welfare rates, they managed to get a lot of people off welfare without a social catastrophe. That's one very good thing that they did. But they never confronted the dynamic of runaway spending. And gradually, people in Alberta got more and more used to the idea that the government would always be there spending copiously, spending more than virtually any other jurisdiction in Canada. And that was not what people thought they meant by the Alberta advantage. Now, there are some people who boast that Alberta has changed. They're very happy that this old-time sort of right-wing cow town has vanished in the rearview mirror. So the mayor of Calgary. And it is extraordinary, is it not, that Calgary would elect the first Muslim mayor of a major North American city, non-white, very left-wing and proud of it, and having elected him would be happy with him and would re-elect him. That does seem like a sign of change. And Alison Redford certainly thought the province had changed. When she was elected Tory leader, she said, and I quote, today Alberta, Alberta voted for change. Sort of odd when you've taken over a party that's been in office for 40 years. Sounds like they voted for continuity, but she certainly didn't think so. And when she was uh, marched in Edmonton's Gay Pride Parade, she said, I think it speaks to who we are. It speaks to the fact that we are a very different province than we were many years ago, and I'm very proud of that. As the Globe and Mail said that uh, Nahid Nenshi's victory in Calgary, um, he was a rallying point for progressive Alberta, young and old, white and non-white, eager to debunk their city's conservative cow town image. And it may well be true that Alberta has shed some rough edges that it's a lot better off without over the last couple of decades. But it has also shed its attachment, such as it was, to small government. And so, in that sense, the problems that exist in Alberta are very much like the problems that exist everywhere else in the world. When Ed Stelmach was told that the government had funded an anti-oil sands documentary, he talked about how great it was that it would bring in tourism. This is not what you'd expect from the province of, let's say, Ernest Manning. You know, Jim Prentice got himself in a world of hurt in the uh, 2015 election when he said that uh, Albertans should look in the mirror if they want to know who's responsible for the province's fiscal mess. That's not the sort of thing politicians are meant to say, but he was right about that. Fundamentally, it is the citizens who, through their votes, determine what kind of government they have. And Albertans were not voting for a kind of government that was spectacularly different than anything else out there. Now, I said that this wasn't really about Alberta. It's also not really about government. The government is the focus of the discussion and government policy because government policy is causing problems with the economy to say nothing of what would happen if they really did hit the wall. And the point of good government is to allow people to live flourishing private lives. That's why we want peace, order, and good government, is that we shall be left alone to create wealth, to share it with those in need, to look after our families, 
to pursue our own dreams. But of course, it's very much about government because the principal danger right now is not that the price of oil has fallen. It's not that technology is changing. It's that government is taking far too much out of the economy. It is regulating the economy far too heavily. And it is threatening to precipitate a fiscal crisis that would make what the damage it's already done a whole lot worse. And again, the, the problem in Alberta, it's remarkable. The Fraser Institute did just put out this study about how Canada's uh, fisc past fiscal leaders are now fiscal laggards, particularly Ontario and Alberta, which following Ralph Klein and Mike Harris seem to be in good shape and were certainly in better shape than their rivals. And in that publication, they have one chart that shows a massive increase in debt in those two provinces. And in defense of Alberta, I want to say that number is going to look a lot worse if your debt was small. A relatively small absolute increase is a far higher percentage increase if you were starting from a low level. But there's another one that shows increase in program spending. And here you see numbers that are s clearly unsustainable. In Ontario, they've been having a fiscal problem that's been getting worse for years, and yet they are continuing to spend lavishly, increasing it, you know, again, 8% a year. In Alberta, it's newer. But spending is running away, it seems to me, with the budget. But this probably is where the problem is. But I don't want to prejudice the outcome of our discussion here. We're here to hear from a number of people with a number of different ideas. When you have a budget deficit, in the big picture, in principle, there's only two ways to get rid of it, right? Either you spend less or you take in more. Or, of course, some combination of the two that meets. But when it comes to spending less, there are a number of things you can try to do. You could make across the board cuts, or you can try to go through the budget removing those things that are least effective. When it comes to increasing revenue, you can raise tax rates and hope that brings in more money. You can cut tax rates and hope that it stimulates the economy to the point that that brings in more money. You can try to remove regulations so that the economy is so much healthier that without making really drastic budgetary choices, the revenue base expands. There are lots of different things you can do. You could probably do a lot of these things and probably should. But there are all sorts of tools that are available, and there are only these tools, as I said at the outset. And speaking of things the conference is not, it's not a partisan gathering. Danny said at the beginning, a lot of people think all we, all we have to do is elect a conservative government and everything will be fine. And there are several reasons why that is not a safe thing to do or a prudent one. The first is the best thing that would hap could happen is that the incumbent administration would right the ship. That would save a whole lot of time and money. If those in power realize that the things they're doing aren't achieving the results they hoped for or wanted, and that they're going to produce worse rather than better results as they go along, then they can take these tools and fix the problem before we don't have to wait for another election. The other problem is that we have a long history of parties that say they're going to fix the mess, and once they get elected, say and mean, oh, it's worse than we thought. We didn't understand. We hadn't really thought through the issues. So the idea here is for everybody in power or aspiring to it, right of center, left of center, middle of the road, baffled, whatever their political orientation may be and their ideological orientation, to understand what their choices are and, again, what their choices are not. There are things you can do, and there are things that you cannot do. Now, cutting spending is not going to be easy. I had the opportunity to speak to another gathering of the Economic Education Association of Alberta a couple of months ago, and I started out by quoting Theodore Roosevelt, who said that far and away the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. So there you go. Hooray, right? Because this is work worth doing, and it is going to be hard. Cutting spending will never be easy. And it will never be easy, even though very few politicians actually like deficits. If they're compelled to run them, they'll say they're doing it on purpose. But except maybe, you know, in his early days as Ontario Premier, Bob Ray was having fun shocking the bourgeoisie until he realized he really was doing something he shouldn't be doing. But for the most part, politicians would like to balance the budget. Left-wing politicians would love to be able to say, sure, we have big dreams and big hearts, but look, we're prudent managers. Everybody would like to do it, but... Big spending programs have big constituencies. Small spending programs have big constituencies, or else very determined constituencies. 
The state has become very good at handing out benefits in return for citizen support, not just support at the ballot box for a particular party, but for the whole apparatus and idea of big government. And it is very hard to cut almost anything. Everybody who tries comes away bruised from the experience, frequently without having gotten much done. The second point that everybody needs to understand, citizens and politicians alike, you have to cut real spending, not imaginary spending. The amount of talk that you hear of government waste. People talk about a $10 billion deficit, we'll get rid of it by cutting waste. Well, for goodness sakes, if it were that easy to cut waste, somebody would have done it years ago, because you're not the first people to have this problem. Milton Friedman was once asked about government waste and said there's no such thing. All there is is government operations. This is what governments are like, and you must accept that. Or there's a classic line from Yes Minister when um, Jim Hacker is talking about cutting bureaucracy, and Sir Humphrey Appleby, the arch uh, bureaucrat, has to explain to him, Minister, the cause of bureaucracy is programs. All these people are here in these offices around you to administer the things that you politicians have created. If you do not have red tape, you have no accountability. And so, again, you cannot get rid of it by ceasing to use so many paper clips. You cannot solve the fiscal crisis by making people use pencils until they're this long instead of this long. This is not where the money goes. You look at the American government, which is famous or infamous, depending how you look at it, for having the largest military establishment in the world. But the American government spends far more money on social programs than it does on the military. I don't mean it spends more money on social programs taken as a whole. I mean, it spends more money on various individual social programs than it does on national defense. And the same thing is certainly true if you look at Alberta's budget projections. Obviously, the Alberta government does not invest heavily in defense. Um, their aim, apparently, is to take in about $45 billion and spend about $55 billion. So you've got a 20% deficit, which is quite an alarming number. But where is the money going? Well, $21.4 billion is going on health. Virtually every province, health care is around 40% of all spending. And if you try to cut health spending, especially if you haven't got some plan for making it far more efficient, you are going to face a terrible outcry from the populace. 8.2% is education, and 6 is advanced education. So there's another $14 billion that you will be accused of being heartless and hurting children or blighting the future of Alberta's youth if you try to touch it. And then you've got community and social services, 3.3 billion, children's services, 1.3 billion. And yes, some of it's managers, but they're managing programs that need to be managed, and a whole lot of it's frontline workers. So suppose you need to cut public sector spending by 20%. Do you lay off 20% of public sector workers? Do you impose a 20% pay cut? You know, neither of these seems to be possible, but you've got to do something because spending is 20% higher than revenue. And one thing you can do is whistle for a wind. You can wait and hope that money comes pouring in. Another thing you can do is try to raise taxes. And again, I'm not in favor of raising taxes, but I'm in favor of honest government. I'm in favor of paying for what you take. So maybe that's one of the options people have to think about. But how do you raise $10 billion in taxes? This is not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen by trivial measures. You would have to really raise tax rates, or you would have to cut tax rates and simplify the system, believing that this would make the economy grow a lot faster. These are options, but they are rather an exhaustive list of the options. And as I said, and I'll come back to this, Ralph Klein dealt with a temporary crisis, but he never tackled the structural dynamics. He never tried to deal with why the programs took more and more money every year, why governments across the civilized world tend to outrun whatever revenue is available. Again, the Milton Friedman line, governments will spend whatever they take in plus whatever they can get away with. And Ralph Klein never gave any attention to that, nor, I think, did the people around him. By the end, Roger Douglas, the reforming labor uh, finance minister in New Zealand, he did start to think about this. He, when people would ask him, how can you get rid of compulsory unionization? How can you get rid of government monopolies? You're a socialist. His answer was, it's because I'm a socialist and I don't believe in entrenched privilege. I don't believe in an elite inside government that treats itself much better than it treats the citizens. And at one point, 
he said, by the late 20th century, the most disturbing question about social welfare and the poor and the disadvantaged was not how much it cost, but what it had bought. So one of the things that I think needs to be done is to ask ourselves whether all the spending that we think is essential to prevent the rending of the social fabric might not, in fact, be itself damaging to social cohesion and the well-being of the intended beneficiaries. But all of this requires people to look hard at the options and think hard about them. And there's a whole lot of that not going on. Uh, Kathleen Wynne in Ontario was just faced with a rather awkward situation where the municipalities, who are terribly short of money, like governments everywhere, had asked for a 1% increase in the provincial sales tax so that they could work on their infrastructure, which indeed needs work. And uh, she <coughs> brushed this aside as though a spider had landed on her brow. Um, we're not going to raise taxes. Uh, Kathleen Wynne is not a right-wing politician. She's like, no, no, I'm not going to make people pay more taxes. So she'd asked the municipalities for new revenue ideas. When they came back with one, she said, not a chance. Forget it. Where did that come from? But what was she going to do? Well, she didn't know. She hoped something would turn up. So the airplane two solution, you know, ignore it, hope it's gone in the morning. It's, it doesn't work that way. And then the NDP leader said, yeah, we considered that increase. No, we're not going to do that. Life is getting more and more difficult every day, so no tax increase. Progressive conservative leader Patrick Brown, no, I'm not in favor of tax increases. No to an HST increase. No property tax increases. Maybe we can identify cost inefficiencies. That was, he came back to the paper clips. But it's not about the paper clips. So, what we're here to do today is make sure that people understand that the problem is a big problem, that it's going to take courage and determination to make it go away, and that it is far better to do it now than to do it after the crisis actually hits, as it assuredly will if governments do not get a grip on their budgets and on what they're doing to the economy, through everything from high taxes to irrational regulation. Our job is to put these tools on the table and say, this is the toolkit. These are good tools. These are workable tools. You will have trouble figuring out how to do this. It will be administratively difficult. It will be politically difficult. But this is the problem you have to fix, and this is what's in the box to fix it. And there isn't anything else. So don't hope that something is going to fall from the sky. It won't. Do not hope a miracle will happen. It won't. It's time that citizens appreciated what needs to be done and supported politicians willing to do it. And it's time that politicians took the option seriously, realistically, and said, here are the things we can do, here are the things we are going to do, and here's why we're going to do it, to level with the people and have the people be grown up about what needs to be done. That's what's necessary to get back the Alberta advantage. In Alberta, across Canada, and anywhere that governments are having the kind of problems that Alberta shares with virtually the entire advanced world today. The Alberta advantage is something anybody can have, but nobody can have it easily, and we're going to explain how to get it back. So let's say Alberta does something. However this gets done, and within our Canadian system, we got reducing services in Alberta, we got, we got a, can't offer this, more has to be privatized or whatever, and the rest of the country doesn't and we actually start to get our fiscal house in order, and then they come in and say, well, you guys are in such good shape, we need you to share more of your wealth so that we can maintain our service that we're not prepared to deal with. Right. How, do we, how do we stop that from stopping us from even making that first step? Well, I, it shouldn't stop you from making the first step. I, f frankly, I think that's a problem Alberta would love to have, is being a target for being plundered. Alberta would not wish to be plundered, but wouldn't it be nice to be back in a situation where you were a tempting target? And then you have to stand up, if it works in Alberta, and say, no, you too can have prosperity. Why do you want to be on the dole from your Western cousins from now till the end of time? How is this good for your people? How is this good for the long-term prospects? All the people who came out from the Atlantic provinces to work in the oil fields, it was great that they could do that. And many of them were very happy and sent a lot of money home. But wouldn't you like to have jobs back in Nova Scotia or New Brunswick? Wouldn't you like to have people going from Alberta to Newfoundland to find work? So I think that there's, to get it done at all would take a great deal of courage and frankness. And that would be something that would then set the stage for more of the same. 
So I'm never optimistic. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Optimism is a psychological condition, generally a fatuous one. But I'm hopeful. And I'm hopeful, among other things, that people will respond to honesty tied to a vision that the future can be better and that we can actually enjoy making the future better. Because one of the odd things about Canada today, including Alberta, is that we tend to believe the government has to do things for us. But that, even if it worked, it wouldn't be fulfilling. You know, people say there's no free lunch, and there isn't. But free lunches aren't nourishing. Wouldn't Albertans feel better if they could say one day, we did this ourselves? And then to say to people in other parts of the country, we're not inherently superior to you. The Alberta advantage isn't genetic. You can do this too, and then you can say to your children, this province used to receive equalization, and people thought it could never stop. But we stopped it. And I do think people would respond to that. Certainly, I think it's worth a try, partly because I haven't got a better plan. But I think that's actually a better plan than it sounds like. Uh, John, in my opinion, I think the federal deficit debts are much more dangerous because the province can borrow money from banks and issue bonds, and it has to be that. But the federal government, uh, where money is not backed up by gold, it's just backed up by government debt. That's far more dangerous because they're allowed to print money without any precious metal support. They keep creating debt over and over, where at the end, that debt steals production from people that are working. How do we attack that? That is the real <laughs> Well, I think that um, they're all dangerous. And they're, all, they're dangerous in different ways. I, I think the federal debt is quite dangerous. And for one thing, at least the provinces could run to the feds in an emergency. Uh, the federal government has really nobody to run to. But you start where you are, right? You, you do what you can. You use what you have. And so fix Alberta's problems. And then you can tell the federal government, look, this is how it's done. I'm looking through my notes here because one of the things that people, I think, don't understand about provincial finances is there are large unfunded liabilities for health care. Um, and again, I'm, I'm relying on a C.D. Howe Institute study here because they have been very vigilant about this to surprisingly li little effect. But again, you know, we all do what we can. They said Alberta has a half trillion dollar fiscal burden, a future tax bill for increased health care costs over the next half century for which no provision has been made. The federal government also has unfunded liabilities for its pension obligations to its employees. There are fiscal landmines in all kinds of places throughout the Canadian Federation. But there's a Samuel Johnson, this is very pertinent, this was my quotation for the day, it wasn't planned, it just happened that way, that those who wait to do a great deal of good at once will never do any good. So we've got to start with what we can do, just because it's worth doing in itself and because then it shows people it is possible to tackle these problems and ideally it is possible to tackle these problems and enjoy an increase in public support. Because if you can do that, if you can fix Alberta's budget problem and get reelected, they will notice that in Ottawa, even if more noble motors aren't driving them, they'll think to themselves, hey, wait a minute. This is the ticket to our continuance in office. And politicians care a great deal about that. But that never happened in the 70s because lobbying, we had surpluses, and Trudeau kept raising the, the deficit, so he didn't care. Well, he, he, he kept promising, promised to see things to face, he said, this is what we have to do to keep Canadiana and people that collect. So I, I don't think that works uh, because it, we're very regionalized. We're a federal, not a union. People in Eastern Canada, the Maritimes, that's how they vote. It doesn't matter to them. Well, and it may be that you can't do anything about the federal situation, but that doesn't mean you should also let Alberta go bankrupt, right? One thing at a time. Um, and, and yeah, let's well, do... What's, what's the use? We, we, we're, we're productive. Uh, we have been. We take care of uh, deficits and debts, but then at the same time, we, come, we, we become obligated to the federal debt, which keeps building and building, and nobody pays attention to that. You, you, have, to start, yeah. you have, have to start somewhere. I heard the story about the guy who was walking home at night, and there's the guy on his knees under the night, underneath the lamplight, he's crawling around, feeling in the grass, and the fellow said, what are you doing? He said, I'm looking for my pen. He said, oh, did you lose it here? He said, no, but at least I can see here. You know what I mean? And like, we were in Alberta, like, I mean, we, like there's lots of problems. Like I asked Mark Yoki, he was speaking about Canada's debt or Ontario's debt, and I said, isn't Ontario doing the same thing to Canada as Greece did to the European Common Market? He said, no, it's far worse. Because he said the European Common Market could pay off Greece's debt if they wanted to. But he said, like uh, Ontario's debt 
is so big that it'll scuttle the system if they collapse. But at the end of the day, like all we can, like we can't even, like the first thing we have to do is save ourselves. Like, I mean, we have to uh, fix ourselves, which I think we're pretty, I think that's what you're going to talk about, isn't it, Marcel? Is sort of how do we get, how do we at least, what are some first steps? We can start here. Like we can't start in Ottawa, but we could start here.